Hello, I am Pamela Hughes. I've met many of you. I'm Senior Director of Philanthropic Engagement here at the Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you and introduce Brad Bowman, Deborah Lunder, and Alan Zekowitz, Founder Circle Member in the School of Historical Studies. Hailing from Kansas City, Brad came east to Harvard University, where he earned his bachelor's and master's degrees and then a PhD in the history of science in 2021. He went on to do a two-year postdoc at the Institute on the Formation of Knowledge at the University of Chicago before coming to IAS this year. Brad's research focuses on the production and transformation of knowledge about organism and life in science, medicine, and technology, exploring intersections with environmental history and the history of capitalism. His first book, the topic of his talk this evening, traces the emergence of the laboratory dog as an experimental subject in eugenics, radiobiology, pharmacology, tobacco research, and neuroscience. The book demonstrates how American lab-raised beagles became transnational laboratory commodities and how scientists came to understand themselves and what it means to be human through beagles. While at U Chicago, Brad Kiel curated Dogfight, the Animal Experimentation Debate in 20th Century Chicago, an exhibit for the Hannah Holborn and Gray Special Collections Research Center, which explored the American fight over research uh, use of pound dogs. At IAS this year, he's working on a second book project that looks at the history of mycology, the study of fungi, a group that includes mushrooms and yeasts. He uses shifting ideas about what fungi are and to, to do to investigate our understandings of life and liveliness, situated within a transnational story about science, data, labor, and capitalism. Beyond his academic work, um, Brad was a founding associate editor of The Drift, a magazine of culture and politics that features new work by young writers. Brad, on behalf of the Friends, thank you for agreeing to spend some time with us this evening to discuss the Lab Dog, What Global Science Owes American Beagles. Um, may I also say thank you all and you for braving what is truly incredible weather today to be here with us. Uh, there will be time for questions after the talk. My light's up. Okay, and I'm off. Great. Uh, so thank you so much to everybody. It's really good to start tonight, especially with the weather, as bad as it is. Uh, that was such a generous introduction. I don't have to say too much. But I do want to thank Miles Jackson for bringing me here to the IAS uh, this year in the School of Historical Studies. Uh, I also want to thank the Herodotus Fund and the Founders Circle Member Fund for making possible a year sort of dedicated to peer research, which at my career stage is, is an exceptionally rare and difficult thing to get. So I'm very generous. I'm very happy uh, to be here and to have this generous support. So over the next 45 minutes, I'm going to take you on a bit of a whirlwind tour and introduce some themes and stories from the book that I just finished uh, last week, which with any luck, you might be able to buy at Labyrinth Books uh, just in time for the holiday season. Um, I want to um, note quickly before I begin that some of the material is talk may be a little troubling, both for those who love dogs and those who love people, but uh, it's sort of the argument of my work that we need to face some of this history and all its complexity in order to understand our present. So with that, I will get going. So some here may recall when in the summer of 2022, 4,000 beagles were released from the facilities of contract research organization in Vigo after findings of animal safety violations. The event spurred a major public response, including coverage in national newspapers, uh, adopters were found for many of the dogs, including most famously, Harry and Meghan, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. Many people questioned why anyone would consider experimenting on such adorable dogs in the first place, and some called for the termination of research with beagles going forward. The dogs, which are so loving and trusting of human beings, seem to deserve something much more than a life of the laboratory. 
If we jump backwards, however, to February 1946, we find ourselves confronting a very different vision of the relationship between dogs and science. This is an invitation to the opening of a new exhibit at the American Museum of Natural History titled, Really, Man's Best Friend, which included an opportunity to see the presentation of that year's Whipple Award. Not to humans, however, but to dogs. The award, named for George Hoyt Whipple, was given to two Dalmatian mixes named Josie and Trixie from the research facilities of the University of Rochester. Their prized collars honored sacrifices made by dogs for the safety of human beings and was presented by Norman Kirk, the Surgeon General of the Army during World War II. Kirk's presence affirmed very explicitly that scientific research with dogs had been essential to American military victory against the Axis powers. And the exhibit, which was organized and funded by the scientific advocacy group, the Friends of Medical Research, argued that the future of science was fundamentally canine. Many problems had been solved, such as blue baby syndrome or the discovery of insulin, and many solutions were still to come, all thanks to the mutually beneficial relationship of humans and their best friends. So in the remainder of my time, I'm going to show how we got from this to our present moment and how beagles gradually pushed out most of the other breeds of dog to become virtually synonymous with, with dog in the parlance of experimental research. The talk will have five parts, which kind of accelerate. So uh, with that said, we'll start with part one, the nightmare dog show. So in March, 1925, Cornell Medical School anatomist, Charles Rupert Stockard, who's pictured here, approached Wycliffe Rose, the head of the General Education Board, about a new project that he sought funding for. As Stockard explained in a letter a few days later, he was interested in studying how the endocrine system affected human development. Quote, in looking about for the most favorable animal material, I came to realize that the different breeds of domestic dogs supply the most excellent examples of long-bred glandular distortions. He continued, we thus have among the fancy dog breeds wonderful experimental material that has been prepared for us during hundreds of years of carefully selected breeding. Mm -hmm. Now by training, Stockard was a developmental anatomist and like many biologists of the era, he believed in eugenics, the scientific and political project of what he and others thought of as the improvement of the human race. Stockard's interest in normal development was connected to a desire to intervene against what he saw as abnormal development. And he was one of multiple researchers to see in endocrinology an avenue to carry that out. Long before developed understandings of genetics and genetic modification, glandular surgeries and transplantations seemed like a plausible path to correcting what, what was seen as developmental abnormalities and Stockard hoped that dogs would show the way forward. Now, he was not alone in seeing dogs as a kind of metaphor for the eugenic control of human variation. Uh, Leon Whitney, who is remembered today mostly for a series of popular books on dogs and other animals, had actually tried to start a very similar project to Stockard's just a few months earlier at Yale University. As Whitney explained in a letter to the primatologist and eugenics supporter Robert Yerkes, the races of dogs are just as numerous as the races of men. And thus far, in my experience, I have not found that hybridizing produces greater vigor, which fact may also apply to Homo sapiens. So as Whitney saw it, purity in dogs supported the pursuit of purity in humans. And just to be exceptionally clear about where such thinking could lead, Whitney is also remembered for celebrating Hitler's forced sterilization policies, going so far as sending the chancellor a gift copy of one of his books, uh, much to his later embarrassment. So Whitney's dog project got nowhere, but the General Education Board, which eventually morphed into the institution we now know as the Rockefeller Foundation, agreed to fund Stockard, who had significantly more prestige and scientific connection. The next step for Stockard was to find a location. Uh, although he received an offer from Charles Davenport, the director of the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and the Eugenics Record Office, to site his new dog laboratory at Davenport's facilities on Long Island, Stockard instead preferred a site to the north of the city, 
And eventually he settled on a plot of land in, between Peekskill and Yorktown, which is sort of toward the top middle here. Stockard, who was a stern Southerner with a military bearing, had previously worked with guinea pigs and other rodents and small animals, but he had little actual experience with dogs, especially managing a large colony of them. During the early years of his project, he and his assistants ultimately struggled to maintain a healthy environment for their animals. Stockard's dog farm, as the facility became known, was one of the first large colonies of experimental dogs in the United States, and there were very few available answers to basic questions. What should a healthy dog eat? Should they live inside or outside? How can you control external parasites like fleas or internal parasites like hookworm? This video, which is some of the only uh, surviving footage of these facilities, shows what some of the solutions looked like in practice. But because of continuous challenges, Stockard was forced to request multiple supplementary grants just to get his facilities up to code and to get sort of sufficient medical treatments for the dogs. Thus, the budget for 1927 included $5,000 for the purchase of pedigree dogs, along with nearly $2,000 for food and thousands more for supplies, facilities, and equipment. The total is about $440,000 in contemporary terms. It's a very expensive undertaking. Uh, yet, despite all of this money, which the Rockefeller Foundation kept uh, giving him, Stockard struggled to produce what his funders were most hoping for, which was results. <laughs> In one of the few lectures he gave on the project in 1931, he summarized in language that paralleled Whitney's, quote, that it is of great significance that certain human freaks practically parallel in their growth and form these diversified canine types. And you'll have to take my word that it gets much worse than this, but I, I wanted to give a representative example. Um, so Stockard anticipated that this project would last decades. He thought it would go well into the 1940s. But in 1939, just a year after he sat down to finally put some of this together, uh, he died, uh, of likely of lung cancer, although it's not totally clear. His assistant, Ellen Pask, was hired to kind of compile, compile all the material that Stockard had into something that could be published. And with contributions from two graduate student researchers, Oscar Anderson and William James, the book finally appeared in 1941 under the unwieldy name the genetic and endocrinic basis for differences in form and behavior as elucidated by studies of contrasted purine dog breeds and their hybrids. In a review of the manuscript, geneticist Hans Gruneberg, a German Jew who had escaped Nazi Germany to England, was critical yet admiring of what he called an undertaking too vast for a single man and almost too ambitious for a whole department. As Gruneberg mused, if the body has regulative powers, such powers have sadly failed to correct the pandemonium let loose by the reshuffling of dog genes. Is it surprising that the startled author of this nightmare dog show should utter warning after warning against mongrelization of human races? Although Gruneberg asserted that Stockard's work would be influential and long studied, few ultimately knew what to actually do with this mess of data and, and ideas. Indeed, one of its only moments in the public spotlight came from a media story not about Stockard's research, but actually that of the graduate student who had worked there, William T. James. In 1941, amid widespread bombing during World War II, American newspaper readers learned that experimental dogs had actually revealed why certain people were more able to resist the psychological turmoil of war. James had taken Basset hounds and German shepherds, two of Stockard's chosen breeds, and found that it was actually the excitable German shepherds who more effectively coped with a simulated war environment of kind of electrical shocks. Uh, this is a photograph of one of the dogs showing something of what this looked like. Uh, James received his fair share of criticism from humane societies around the country, many of whom argued that he had proven basically nothing other than his own lack of compassion. But compared to today, the response was relatively muted. People were actually quite interested in what he had found. And what I want to highlight here is the structure of this experimental vision, which I think is important. As newspapers explained, James had put dogs through, quote, two kinds of life, one resembling peacetime, the other war. In an experimental setting, he had positioned dogs as kind of proxies 
for different historically contextual human forms of life. And in my work, I argue that this is actually a widespread aspect of animal experimentation, one that I call species projection. The point is not just that it's anthropomorphism or kind of a comparison of dogs and people, but that animal experiments are used as ways of imagining and intervening into human futures and human pasts. What James had shown, many believed, was how and why people survived conflict. And this aspect of species projection, this kind of imaginative and creative element, I think helps to explain why animal experiments have long seemed so persuasive to the public as a form of scientific truth. Uh, humorously, to me at least, New York City poet Harold Fowler actually put James's project into poetic verse. And uh, I'll save you the joys of his cadence and give you only at the end. Uh, as Fowler writes, in short, says Dr. James, it proves that dogs and men are twain in suffering pain. So part two. Now you might be wondering where are the beagles in all of this? Uh, although Stockard's project wound up having very minimal impact on actual genetic research, the study's most significant influence was ultimately in debates about the idea of the breeding of an ideal laboratory dog. In 1939, the National Research Council had established a committee to advise on the breeding of a pure line strain of dogs for scientific purposes. Researchers were increasingly concerned that the dogs used for experiments were overly varied and inconsistent. The majority were collected from the unclaimed populations of local pounds through a system that I have called uh, salvage accumulation. But a number of researchers wanted something more than just pound dogs. They wanted a standard dog or a normal dog, one that was produced consistently in large numbers. They were influenced both by the Worcester Institute's rat, which was the sort of first standard laboratory animal, and the broader development of mass production and tailorism in American factories. The NRC committee, which was largely the result of enthusiastic advocacy from Columbia University researcher Irvin Brand, visited the existing dog colonies, including Stockard's, just before his death. Uh, they didn't really think Stockard's plan was going to work out, but the most promising avenue instead appeared to be a colony of Irish Terriers, which Brand himself had begun breeding a few years before. While studying an inherited metabolic disorder known as cystinuria, Brand had stumbled across a cystinuriac Irish Terrier and succeeded in producing a kind of line of Terriers who all inherited the condition. But he also thought that these terriers might be the foundation for the standard dog that so many researchers had long dreamed of. Not everyone was totally sold on this vision, however. Maryland researcher Magnus Gregerson, for instance, had tried to develop his own colony of experimental dogs a few years earlier and chose beagles as his breed of choice. After moving to Columbia, he had to give up his beagle colony, but he begrudgingly adopted Brand's dogs instead. On the other hand, the Rockefeller Foundation, who Brand hoped would fund his colony, were still so stung by Stockard's failures that they refused to pay for another risky, expensive dog colony. As Rockefeller officer Alan Gregg noted in a retrospective summary about Stockard's work, quote, I doubt if projects involving the breeding and raising of animals requiring upwards of a year to mature can be undertaken on the basis of grants to a single individual through his university connection. The proper setting would more probably be small but endowed institutes or laboratories with full-time personnel and the opportunity and necessity for training competent successors. So Greg and many others still wanted a, a sort of standard dog, but it would clearly require a different approach than the one that Stockard or Brand was taking. One such opportunity soon presented itself in the form of Clarence Crook Little, the head of the Jackson Memorial Laboratory in Bar Harbor, Maine, which would become most famous for producing a line of standard mice for research purposes. Uh, Little was on the side, a lifelong dog fan. His father had been a dog breeder. So he was very interested in this idea of, of building a kind of program of, of dog, of kind of standard dog breeding and agreed to oversee a new study of the genetics of canine behavior at Jackson. But rather than Brand's dream of a kind of Irish terrier factory, the Jackson Project would instead involve five major dog breeds, the Senjis and Shetland Sheepdogs, who were thought to represent kind of behavioral extremes, and three ostensibly normal types of dog, the Cocker Spaniel, 
the wire-haired fox terrier, and of course the beagle. And although it was not the explicit goal, Little and Greg both hoped that this laboratory might incidentally, through more hybrid breedings, kind of generate the ideal or the perfect uh, laboratory dog. Now, the, the breeds selected for work at Jackson were not completely surprising choices at the time. Indeed, they represented some of the most popular dogs in the United States. From 1936 until 1954, Cocker Spaniels were the single most registered dog in America, followed closely by Beagles, who would knock them out of the top spot in the middle of the 1950s. So the ideal scientific dog was fundamentally connected to the ideal pet dog. And unnoticed by many, American dog ownership had become markedly more scientific during this period in the 1940s and 50s. Commercial dog foods, which were popularized during this decade, began to appear in grocery stores, were frequently advertised with an emphasis on their scientific foundations, including these ads for, for games. And you'll notice the beagle, which is not coincidental. So the development of the laboratory dog reinforced the scientific nature of American pet ownership, and scientific pet ownership ended up reinforcing the idea of a standard laboratory dog. Now, in 1954, the Institute of Animal Resources, which would become the Institute for Laboratory Animal Resources, released the first edition of its Handbook of Laboratory Animals, which covered questions of care and disease treatment. The guide also included a short list of suppliers of scientific dogs, uh, only two of which, Lone Trail Kennels in Pennsylvania and Cornell University, actually specified a breed. So most of these would just sell you a dog, but two, two specified a breed, and that breed, of course, was the Beagle. So the dogs were popular, but it was quite difficult to actually buy them in a sort of strict laboratory sense. Now, Americans were not the only ones interested in improving the imagined quality of their scientific dogs. In 1958, French veterinary researchers and pharmacologists debated the ideal chien de laboratoire. Some were interested in German shepherds or Brittany spaniels, but Camille Carpentier here suggested working with fox terriers. He had also coincidentally been approached by Leon Whitney, who we met earlier, about purchasing a line of purebred laboratory beagles from the United States. In Japan, the situation was similar. Leaders of the country's nascent laboratory animal industry championed the need for a standard dog and visited research sites in the United States in order to understand which breeds were popular. In these reports, Beagle, uh, which you can see here, tends to appear in English letters, which is both an indication of its kind of limited familiarity and its importance. Now, I'll return in a bit to why the beagle had suddenly become so obviously promising, but this growing attention to dogs had a number of interesting effects. Uh, one of the more surprising was a rejection of the popular notion of dog years. So most of us have heard of the idea that a dog's human age is basically its calendar years multiplied by seven. This notion dates all the way back to the 1920s, but already actually in 1954, people were learning that it had basically nothing to do with the truth. <laughs> the, the first influential rejection came from a French researcher in a paper, uh, the, his name was Albert Lebeau, called The Age of Dogs and That of Man, in which he used statistics to show that actually dogs age in a kind of initially rapid fashion and then in a much slower pace. So my dog, Laszlo, who's just over three years old, would be around 34 in human terms, according to LeBeau. Uh, and to give just a present perspective on this, uh, the calculations have been further updated over the decades, uh, including this recent study from 2020, which has a complicated mathematical formula that only our, our mathematicians could handle, uh, but does include this very helpful comparison chart of the dog's age. So there were two forces that pushed beagles uh, to the top of the list when it came to recognition as kind of the laboratory dog. The first was the atomic bomb. The second was the long-term contraceptive. Uh, most people here think of the, of the Manhattan Project mostly for the development of catastrophic weapons by IAS alum Robert Oppenheimer and others, but the Manhattan Project also had a very significant biological component, and researchers began to worry very quickly about the dangers of human exposure to radiation. These concerns produced one of the most delightfully vague scientific paper titles of all time. I never get tired of this one. <laughs> 
carcinogenic action of some substances, which may be a problem in certain future industries, obviously radiation, uh, at the Metallurgical Laboratory in Chicago. Uh, testing multiple elements, particularly plutonium, and their isotopes, the Met Lab researchers gradually confirmed that rodents suffered from seriously from irradiation. But because rats had, as one researcher darkly joked, a frustrating tendency of dying before they developed bone cancer, a longer-lived animal was considered necessary in order to produce data that would actually correlate with long-lived beings. <laughs> In Chicago and also across the Great Lakes at the Rochester Atomic Energy Project in upstate New York, researchers began to use an array of mixed breed dogs, including beagles, to test the long-term health effects of radiation. They found, perhaps not so surprisingly, that even dogs who survived initially high doses of radiation could frequently de develop debilitating cancers later on. Thus, when the United States began to plan major post-war nuclear tests, such as Operation Greenhouse, it was decided that dogs needed to be one of the three key experimental organisms. During the June 1949 meeting of the Atomic Energy Commission's Advisory Committee for Biology and Medicine, which you're seeing here, it's not secret anymore, uh, despite the stamps, uh, George Leroy proposed instead using beagles from Rochester. Uh, given the confusion of the meeting notes, however, where Beagle is actually misspelled, it might be hard to see. Um, it's clear that Rochester's Beagles were less a uh, well-defined kind of animal model than a sort of at-hand example of the kind of dog that you might use. So when Greenhouse finally took place, it was actually the larger American Foxhound that was used for the tests instead. But even after Greenhouse, researchers at America's nuclear and atomic laboratories, including Los Alamos, were interested not just in acute effects, but the sort of consequences of long-term exposure to lower doses of radiation. To understand those dangers, two new long-term dog projects were proposed, one at the University of Utah and the other at the University of California, Davis, to study the effects of injected and ingested radioactive materials over multiple decades. Um, I'm skipping a bunch of material here, you'll have to buy the book, but after initially considering foxhounds for these projects, researchers at Utah and Davis eventually settled on beagles, and you're seeing one image from each uh, lab here. Uh, because both labs wanted to produce comparable results, their breed choice needed to be identical. They wanted to work on kind of the same animal. And after Humane Society members complained about their purchases from local breeders, there was a compromise agreement where it was agreed that they would produce all of their beagles in-house at internal laboratories. And the Humane Societies actually agreed and thought this was totally fine. Um, beagles were not, I, I would say though, coincidentally, um, among America's most popular dogs and widely available on the West Coast. So they were easy to buy in large numbers. And of course, Snoopy, one of history's most famous beagles, appeared in his first strip in Peanuts in 1950, the very same year of planning for Utah. This is the first one. He doesn't look much like, like later Snoopy. Um, both labs and the colonies of beagles at other atomic installations, which came to form this group that researchers referred to as the Atomic Beagle Club, produced significant knowledge about radiation but also just a huge amount of knowledge about the care and management of laboratory dogs. Work at Davis was particularly influential in this light. So Alan C. Anderson, the veterinarian who initially headed the project, wrote and spoke widely, not just about nuclear research, but also about strategies for handling dogs, things like kenneling, their longevity, nutrition, even a surgical intervention known as partial ventriculocordectomy or debarking that would sort of limit the noise of the dogs in facilities. In 1970, Anderson published a book, The Beagle as an Experimental Dog, which sort of combined all of this scattered information into one single volume. The book was widely used, and in my experience, it's on the bookshelf of basically every uh, American university animal facility if they still have a library. And in it, Anderson formalized the basic argument for using beagles as an experimental dog. They were small, which meant that they didn't eat much and they were cheap. They were short haired, which means you didn't have to cut their fur. They were docile and they were very eager to please, which meant that they tolerated sometimes invasive procedures better than other breeds did. 
for those with limited experience, Anderson's book, which was basically the only one of its kind, there's, there's no comparable book like this, made the beagle a very approachable dog to, to take up in other settings. Now, just a few years after the projects at Utah and Davis began, the United States Food and Drug Administration had also opened its own beetle colony in July 1954, this time for the testing of drugs and chemicals. The agency had used dogs for these purposes for decades, dating back to the 1920s. Um, and in fact, as this little excerpt from an FDA oral history demonstrates, the first FDA dog colony had actually been based on urban brands, Irish Terriers. They had just not really worked out that well. Uh, the FDA's toxicity testing guidelines were initially sort of recommendations that were published every few years. They weren't, they weren't really strict about these things. Uh, the suggestion to use beagles had become semi-formalized by 1955. Uh, you'll, so you'll see here that Arnold Lehman and colleagues released their new procedures for chemical testing, and the document notes very matter-of-factly, we employ beagles as our dog strain. The FDA's kind of implicit choice was pretty influential. And beagles had also been selected during this period at a large number of American pharmaceutical companies. So Norwich Pharmacal had a beagle colony, Merck, Pfizer, the American cyanamide company, uh, they all had their own beagle colonies, and uh, Seba and Hoffman LaRoche uh, at least used beagles, even if they didn't breed them themselves. So they were suddenly all over the, the pharmaceutical world in, in the Northeast. And in the late 1950s and early 1960s, they went from the American Northeast and started to spread around the world for pharmaceutical testing. So British laboratories were using beagles for pharmaceutical testing by 1958. And because beagles originated in England, this was relatively predictable. But in Germany, on the other hand, where beagles were bred by at least 1960 for pharmaceutical studies at companies like Fabberger Hoechst, researchers had to literally explain the breed and even the tradition of beagle hunting that had produced them because people just didn't really know what beagles were in the first place. And Japanese researchers and French researchers who we met earlier were all kind of responding to this broader international push. Using the same breed of dog would foster a kind of international harmonization within an increasingly international pharmaceutical industry. And the key event that really made this kind of implicit development uh, into a, a broader change came with the controversy surrounding the morning sickness treatment known as thalidomide. Uh, many people here probably know that when it first came out in 1957, thalidomide was heralded as a kind of miracle drug that worked to really resolve morning sickness like, like nothing before. But very quickly, usage of thalidomide became connected to stillbirths and other serious medical anomalies. Americans actually avoided much of the worst case scenario, largely due to the 1960 decision by Francis Oldham Kelsey, who's pictured here, to reject thalidomide uh, because of inadequate testing data. The controversy about thalidomide globally, though, would nevertheless become a major force behind the ultimate success of Senator Estes Kefauver's drug efficacy amendments, which passed in 1962 and established the first requirements for proof of e efficacy of pharmaceuticals in the United States. The FDA, which was requested to provide guidelines for how companies should do this, it's kind of crazy to think about, but companies just didn't know how to prove efficacy in a normal way. Um, asked the FDA what to do, and they followed precedent by saying that tests should be done on rodents, rabbits, and dogs or monkeys. The FDA didn't say what kind of dog, but everybody kind of assumed that when the FDA said dog, they meant beagle. Now, these initial suggestions became a sort of strict legal requirement in 1967, following a second drug scare, this time concerning an experimental contraceptive produced by Merck, Sharp, and Dumb. The compound known as MK665, it was never released, had produced massive mammary tumors in female beagles who it was tested on, which prompted sort of extreme concern about the potential long-term effects on female users. And people who were alive in the 1970s might remember that a huge number of contraceptives were taken off the market because of these tests. Uh, until 1992, because of this, uh, when Beagle testing requirements were finally eased only in the early 90s, virtually all long-term con uh, contraceptive treatments in the United States were tested on the dogs. So they were the default uh, testing animal. And because America's global regulatory and commercial influence, countries around the world all followed the United States by saying that you should use Beagles to test. Mm -hmm. 
Now, these beagles that were being used in companies all around the world were not the locally bred animals of earlier eras purchased from sort of small scale breeders. Increasingly, they were produced in large scale facilities, an approximation of the kind of standard dog factories that early advocates had once imagined. As an advertisement for the commercial breeder Marshall Farms put it in the late 1990s, the beagle was now a global standard with the papers to prove it. Old systems of salvage accumulation and internal production had given way to a mass production model. Researchers around the world could purchase a standard dog and assume that it was relatively similar no matter where they were on Earth. So. Something also started to happen to laboratory dogs, though, over the last few decades since the early 1990s. There are traditional benefits as experimental dogs or to laboratory beagles. The, the traditional benefits, their sweetness, their docility, their ease of use, their standardization, began to actually undermine the rationale for using them, leading to the sort of protests that we now uh, see on the news quite regularly. Over time, in fact, a different vision of the utility of dogs in science began to emerge. And it's centered on the dog's unique kind of environmental nature. So back in 1970, one review of Anderson's Gospel of Beagle Research had made a kind of critical point that most people ignored. John Paul Scott, who oversaw the Dog Behavior Project at Jackson Labs that I mentioned earlier, had argued in science that Anderson's book was excellent and it was very valuable. But he cautioned that there was kind of a problem. However useful the beagle may be, he wrote, to adopt this breed as the laboratory dog in the same way that the albino rat has been used as the organism in psychological research would be a serious error in research technique, for it would throw away the chief unique advantage of dogs, namely their genetic variation. A good experimental dog, Scott argued, was not a genetically uniform tool, but instead a representative of diverse forms and behaviors. Choosing only beagles for research might miss out on the kind of complexity of canine experience. And coincidentally, that same year in 1970, psychologists Martin Seligman and Dennis Groves had made a kind of similar finding. In studies of the phenomenon that many of us know as learned helplessness, in which dogs gradually learned that their efforts to avoid an electric shock wouldn't work, the authors found something kind of interesting. Purebred laboratory beagles, who they used for the research, gave up far more quickly than regular street dogs that they had gotten from the pounds or, or on the street. So something about the diversity of a kind of lived experience of a street dog seemed to kind of protect it from the learned helplessness that befell standard laboratory beagles. And Seligman's study highlights the rarity, actually, of using dogs for research into complex cognition and psychology. Although long popular for studies of behavior, such as Pavlov's famous conditioning studies, many considered dogs largely incapable of higher order cognitive tasks until well into the 1990s. It was only in 1981, for instance, that a, strud a study by Estrella Triana and Robert Paznak at George Mason found that dogs actually demonstrated higher levels of object permanence than cats. When they were subjected to what's known as an invisible displacement task, like those you see here, which test the ability of an animal to develop kind of an abstract schema for an object, it was actually dogs who were far more successful than cats in identifying where the object had moved to. A follow-up study in 1992 by psychologists Sylvain Gagnon and Francois Doré confirmed with an even larger experimental cohort and better experimental controls that the comparative ability of dogs was real. And they excluded various alternative explanations, like maybe the dogs were just smelling the treat in one place or the other. As they summarize, dogs are able to solve this kind of problem by representations. They can mentally reconstruct the trajectory of an object they did not directly perceive by using the information provided by a relevant signal. This is a pretty like, stark departure from decades of thinking about what dogs could do cognitively. These studies and a host of others, including research at the University of Toronto around the same time with former nuclear beagles, formed what some now call the 1990s dog paper boom. And there was all of a sudden just a huge amount of research about canine cognition, which demonstrated further and further information about all of the miraculous things that dogs are capable of doing. So one uh, example of this is vision. 
Uh, in the 1940s, optometrist Gordon Lynn Walls had argued on the basis of sort of previous research that dogs basically fail to distinguish any color from gray. As Walls summarized, for the dog, it is form and to a lesser extent brightness, which are important qualities of visual stimuli. And this is from the 63 printing, but it happened in the 40s. Uh, so Walls was actually very influential in his view of canine vision. And it spread the sort of common notion that dogs only see black and white, that they have sort of a grayscale vision, but nothing else. But this idea has actually been challenged over the last few decades in quite firm and successful ways. Although dogs possess uh, two cone photoreceptor cells instead of three, which we have, uh, it's very clear that they can perceive and differentiate colors like blue, yellow, and gray, and probably even red and green. So they, they absolutely per perceive color in some form. And recent studies have even demonstrated that dogs actually also perceive ultraviolet light in a way we might not be able to. So they may even have vision that is, that is better than ours in some forms. So dogs, it turns out, from all this research, are very co cognitively complex creatures. One of the first books to really popularize this idea for a general audience was Stanley Corrin's The Intelligence of Dogs. Uh, this book was based less on like actual experimental research than just a survey of obedience judges. But it's partly responsible for the very common sense idea about which dog breeds are sort of smarter or more intelligent than others, with border collies and poodles at the top and other breeds sort of lower on the list. If you've read any recent articles about dogs in science, you're likely to have found a story like this one in the Washington Post which argues that the similarity between dogs and people actually offers possibilities for new comparative approaches to diseases like cancer or Alzheimer's. There's now significant evidence that dogs, for instance, develop dementia in forms that kind of parallel human dementia. And they also seem to develop cancers due to many of the same environmental and behavioral causes. And there are two things that I wanna highlight about these studies as I sort of work toward the end of the talk. Now, the, the first is that these articles tend to stress that it's not just parallel physiology, it's not just that dogs have similar brains, but it's the shared environment of dogs and people that makes dogs so unique and useful as experimental animals. The fact that dogs live in our homes, breathe the air of cities, share some of the same food, all of these things make dogs kind of uniquely uh, valuable as an experimental creature. And in my research, I call this sense the kind of environmenticity of experimental dogs, this idea that they are defined in part by the sharing of the human environment. And I argue that this has become a major driver of how people use dogs in modern and contemporary science. And if a shared environment is part of an experimental dog's value, then the traditional laboratory beagle bred in a controlled setting and kept inside for decades is in some ways not the ideal animal for studies of cancer or for studies of, of dementia. Instead, like my dog is an ideal uh, animal because he lives with me and has all of the same uh, things affecting him. So one of the largest contemporary canine research undertakings is the Dog Aging Project, which started at the University of Washington about a decade ago. And the image on its front page uh, seems, at least to me, to kind of em emphasize the environmenticity of dogs, the way this dog is just in a field, uh, sort of defined by that field. Um, but the Dog Aging Project does something really interesting. If you go to the Frequently Asked Questions section, it insists that the, the, the researchers do not conduct experiments on laboratory or captive dogs. Instead, all dogs who participate are enrolled by their owners into the study. The project calls this approach, quote, community science. And it argues that community science is enabling a new participative sort of relationship between regular people and professional researchers. And the Dog Aging Project is, is far from the only one to use this approach. There's a parallel undertaking from the Morris Animal Foundation called the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study, which also involves the participation of dog owners and their companions. And anecdotally from walking around campus, I feel like there are some people who might uh, want to join that study. <laughs> uh, now, the goal in both cases is to understand how and why dogs age in order to apply those insights to how and why people age. So if we figure out why dogs get old and decrepit, we might understand why those things happen to people as well, and we might be able to reverse some of those things. And researchers have also been quite explicit about how this new pet dog paradigm, in the words of David Waters, is not just useful for taking advantage of the shared environment, 
but also because it actually resolves some of the traditional challenges of dog research. Where the atomic laboratories struggled with funding, Waters notes that actually working with pet dogs lowers the purchase and the per diem costs of hosting an internal laboratory colony. Because in this model, the dog owner is basically a volunteer animal technician that pays for all of the food themselves. In addition, researchers Chad Khanna and David Vale have highlighted how work with companion dogs might avoid problems with animal rights activists who have targeted laboratory dog colonies for decades. The activists can't really protest something if it's just you volunteering your dog for a study. Now, I have started to think about this broader model as companion science, a sort of unity of traditional visions of citizen science with new ideas about human dog companionship that have developed over the centuries. And I argue that companion science is increasingly positioned as sort of the future of research with laboratory animals. There is a kind of uh, historical irony here because laboratory dogs were produced in part to stop scientists from using people's pets in research. We've come all the way back around where the pet is the ideal research subject. But another way to think about it, I think, is that many people today treat dogs as well as early labs treated their standard experimental dogs. The kind of quality of life of dogs has increased quite dramatically in a number of ways. And as their prominence is displaced by the growth of companion science, it's likely that beagles will continue to be scientific creatures, but they're less likely to do so as laboratory dogs and more likely to do so as companions. So to conclude, I want to return once more to the middle of the 20th century. In September 1956, the San Francisco Chronicle featured a small story about the University of California Davis Beagle Colony and this fantastic cartoon. It ends with a really interesting apology. We are sorry, they write, that it is necessary for the beagle to act as a guinea pig in an experiment that involves our safety and well-being. He is a victim of man's inability to put a leash on the atom and, even more to the point, on himself. It is a tough test of the friendship of man's best friend, but perhaps the beagle is the best one to undergo it. If any friendship could survive the estimated 15 to 20 years of the test, it would be the friendship of the beagle toward his irresponsible master. And so as much as humanity's relationship with dogs has transformed in the decades since this was written, I think we're still very much caught in this same logic of apologetic necessity and irresponsible mastery. Whether in determining the dangers of radiation or drugs or cigarettes and much more, dogs were undeniably victims of an inability to put a leash on ourselves. Yet understanding of their complex lives also increased dramatically at the same time. So there's a kind of seesawing balance between the benefits and the harms. In this way, we might say solutions to the problems of animal experimentation are also solutions to the problems of social order. The friendship between dogs and humans could have taken other paths, and it might still. But beagling and history share, I would say, in the absence of predetermined destinations. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.